Good morning, everyone. I see that these are the folks who didn't want to wake up for the cantata. Oh, or you love us so much you stayed for both. Well, either way, I want to welcome you, whether you're joining us in person or online. Uh, just welcome this morning. This is the last Sunday before Christmas. Is anybody excited? There were like five people that were excited. That's, we're, see, we're slowly like getting better. Sometimes it's only three, you know. But uh, so why don't we stand up? Why don't we uh, kick this morning off with singing a song, uh, a Christmas song? So I know that you guys will know this song, so you have to sing it with me, all right? You have to sing loud because there's so few of us, all right? Try something different this morning. Okay, so you guys missed the traditional service. If you were expecting the traditional service, I apologize. But we're going to add a, a traditional element here for you, okay? So first, we got to warm up our voices. So guys, you got to sing. So here's what we're going to do. First, I want to hear the guys sing. We got to warm up. Ready? Oh, here you guys. All right, I, here's the problem is I know the ladies are going to put us to shame, so. All right, ladies, let me hear you just do, like, give me an ah, warm up, okay? I'm not going to I'm not gonna sing that high. That'll sound fun. Ready? One, two, three. That was a little bit better. So you guys have to at least say these words with me, okay? But first, we're going to start with the guys. Ready? Hallelujah, your turn. Shout out to the ladies, ready? Hallelujah. All right, guys, one more, all right? Hallelujah. The ladies, hallelujah. And everybody, real quick. Hallelujah. 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 But you didn't think you were going to hear the Handel's Messiah Hallelujah chorus this morning, right? Okay, so now that you're warmed up, I want to hear you sing. He rules the world with truth and grace and makes the nations prove the glories of his righteousness and wonders of his love and wonders of his love and wonders, wonders of his love and wonders, wonders of his his love. All right. Well, good morning. And again, thank you for joining us. Uh, you may be seated. Good morning, everybody. I'm Pastor Gary Rideout, one of the co senior pastors here at St. Andrews United Methodist Church, along with my wife, Jane, who will be sharing the message today. So welcome to this special edition of the Contemporary Service, 11 o'clock today. You got to sleep in a little bit longer today, so hope you appreciate it. Just want to tell you about a few announcements here before we continue on with our worship. Uh, you know, uh, spoiler alert, Christmas Eve is Friday. So I hope you all knew that. But we have four services this Friday. We've got a 5.30, excuse me, a 4.30 service was specifically for families. It's, it's, it's a, a family-friendly one, so bring your young kids to it your grandkids, whatever. 
Uh, 6.30 is contemporary worship service. Uh, 8.30 is the traditional. And then 11 o'clock is traditional with communion. At all services, we will have a candlelight and um, at all of them. So we hope you'll plan around to invite some of your family and friends to some of these. We have a special um, news services uh, this year. They're, they're uh, already pre-produced. They're for the live stream audience. There'll be a 5.30 uh, contemporary one and 11.30, excuse me, 5.30 contemporary, 7.30 traditional. It's made specifically for people who will be watching on live stream. So I hope you'll take advantage of that. You can watch it on um, Facebook or website or the app. And again, invite your friends and families to celebrate this uh, wonderful evening with us. Next uh, Sunday, the day after Christmas, the 26th, we only have one service. That'll be at 10 o'clock uh, here in the sanctuary and on live stream. 10 o'clock will be a blended service. So we invite you to, to join us in person or online. So let's continue with our worship and let's light the Advent candle as we have we invite the Walsh family to come forward. You ready? Okay. We light this candle in order to prepare the way of peace. In a world that is often filled with chaos and strife, Remember that there is peace that comes from God alone. May the peace that passes all human understanding break into the world this Advent. May we prepare the way of peace. Please join us for the congregational response. O come, O come, Emmanuel, bring your peace. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee. O Israel, sing that again. And rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. Let's continue in our worship this morning. If you would like to stand and join me, uh, we're going to uh, sing another song, Every Giant Will Fall. I can see the promised land, though there's pain within the plan, there is victory. In the end, your love is my battle cry. When my fears like Jericho build their walls around my soul. When my heart is overthrown, your love is my battle cry. The anthem for all my life. Sing every giant. Every giant will fall, the mountains will move, every chain of the past, you broke it into a hope of fear over lies. We're singing the truth that nothing is impossible. The shadows steal the light. Your love is my battle cry. The anthem for all my life. You sing every giant. Every giant will fall. The mountains will move. Every 
It's just a good reminder because Christmas is a time where we, where we feel like we should feel hopeful or we feel like we should feel peace or love or joy or any of these other things that we're celebrating. And sometimes we just don't feel that way. You know, there's so much going on during Christmas time. I think you can probably uh, empathize with me in knowing that you feel like there's so many things to get done and peace is probably the last thing that you feel, right? Maybe after everything's done. <laughs> But just knowing that uh, God is with us, that he promises to walk beside us, I think that that should teach us to respond in humility to him and just say, thank you. You know, and we can find peace in that in the midst of chaos, of knowing that he is with us. He came to earth. That's what we're celebrating is the love that he showed when he came to earth to be with us, to dwell with us. So let's sing this next song, um, We Fall Down. It's about just laying our authority down and recognizing him. We fall down, we lay our crowns at the feet of Jesus. The greatness of mercy and love at the feet of Jesus. And we cry, holy, holy, holy. We cry, holy, holy, holy. We cry, holy, holy, holy. Is the Sing that again, we fall down. We fall down, we lay our crowns at the feet of Jesus. The greatness of his mercy and love at the feet of Jesus and we cry holy 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 and we cry holy 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 we cry holy 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 is the land 
right now, I just want to take a moment, and they're going to continue playing, but if we can just take this moment and just be in silence, just like some, some reflection with ourselves as they're playing, and uh, just close your eyes for a little bit, and just think about maybe those things that you need to lay down at the feet of Jesus that you think, man, this is really a worry, or this is really causing me anxiety, and maybe if you hand it over to him, you can feel like you're at peace knowing he's in control. So let's just take this moment now. Father, we love you, and we know that you love us, that you've demonstrated that by leaving a perfect eternity and coming here and living with us in the day-by-day day troubles and the different things that we experience and showing us what it means to love God and to serve others in the midst of all of that. And I pray this morning, those things that are on our mind that are, that are worries or the things that we just feel like there's no hope for or whatever it is, that we would be able to trust you with them. Not that they would magically disappear, but we would know that you love us and that you're walking through it with us. And that would bring us peace. In your name, amen. Let's sing this, we cry holy. Father, we love you, and I pray that uh, this morning as we prepare to hear your words, that our hearts would be open to what you say so we can recognize those areas of our lives that we need to lay down before you. And in your name, amen. All right, well, you may be seated. When our hearts are broken... He is the means of grace and forgiveness. When life seems impossible, he shows us moments of heaven on earth through his miracles. He breathes new life into spaces of death and hopelessness. When our world is tipping, and we can't find our balance. He brings us perfect peace and hope. Jesus, the hope of Christmas. My thanks to the band for preparing our hearts to worship and to, to sit under the word of God. My name is Jane Rideout. I'm one of the co-lead pastors, and I want to welcome you today um, on this last Sunday before Christmas. Whether you're at home, here in the building, I'm just so happy we are worshiping together. Do you know what a mosaic is? You know that piece of artwork that's made up of a lot of little pieces of usually gl colorful glass or maybe little broken up tiles that have been all shaped together. They're all different, but they've been shaped together. And they create a mosaic, a picture, a, a piece of artwork that tells a story or is particularly beautiful. And I often think about the Christmas season that it's like a mosaic. It takes all of the stories from all the Gospels, of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John... And the Old Testament prophecies about the coming Messiah 
And it takes all these little pieces from all of these different books in the Bible, and it forms it all together till we have a face of God. So that when we come to, um, to worship, the story we hear comes from a lot of scriptures. It's all pulled together beautifully, and we have this, this face of God and this understanding of Christmas. Unfortunately, we have other pieces of glass in our lives that also get added to our mosaic. Those are the pieces of glass that represent the, the stresses in our lives. And there certainly are a lot of stresses that go with Christmas. There's financial stress. There's should we travel or not travel? Or, or who will we be with or how will we get through the day being with those particular people? There's all kinds of stuff, the busyness, the desire to, to please everybody. There's so much connected to this season. And so all those little pieces of the mosaic also get added to the picture of Jesus. Then there's those pieces of tile or glass that represent those who've been lost. I mean, for some of you, this will be the first Christmas and someone's going to be missing at the table. Or maybe there's a broken relationship and they're still missing and it breaks your heart and the, the season reminds you of the broken relationships. And then there's just all those internal things that we struggle with at Christmas. Maybe this desire for perfection. Maybe it's this desire for a, a Christmas that doesn't actually exist. And so we add all those to our picture of the face of God, and then suddenly we lose sight of the story itself, and suddenly we have this little messed up piece of mosaic that doesn't say anything, but it kind of represents what we feel inside. So the question is, how do we stay focused on the mosaic of Jesus? How do we not, not the season distract us, steal us and rob us of peace? It's funny, but peace is always the end goal of the Advent season, yet sometimes it's the least peaceful time of the year. So I, I want to start out today by uh, reading a scripture to us. It's a story found in Matthew. It's the story of the um, birth of Jesus. And it comes out of Matthew 18. And we're going to continue there. We're in our final and fourth week of Advent where we are going to, where we, led the, we lit the, the candle for peace. And we are, we're focusing on something called a journey of hope. And our reading today is, starts in verse 18. Let's hear the word of God. This is how the birth of Jesus took place. When Mary, his mother, was engaged to Joseph before they were married, she became pregnant by the Holy Spirit. Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man, but he didn't want to humiliate her. So he decided to call off their engagement quietly. And as he was thinking about this, an angel from the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife, because the child she carries was conceived by the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you will call him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Now all of this took place so that what the Lord had spoken through the prophet would be fulfilled. Look, a virgin will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel. And Emmanuel means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did just as the angel from God commanded and took Mary as his wife. But he didn't have sexual relations with her until she gave birth to a son. And Joseph called him Jesus. Now, this is a beautiful story of the birth narrative. There's all kinds of interesting little details into it, and we'll get to those. But the first thing I want you to take notice of is the naming of Jesus. Because the author of this book of Matthew that I'm reading from has a goal, wants you to catch some details here. So I'm going to kind of help point some of those out to you. Did you notice it said, they were quoting Old Testament, that he will be called Emmanuel, but then Jesus names him, excuse me, then Joseph names him Jesus. Did you catch that? Shouldn't his name be Emmanuel? They, they just said that, but then Jesus, then Joseph names him something else. Well, that's part of the concept of a mosaic, first of all. So we never stick with just one book of the Bible when we are telling the narrative. Because they all share different parts and different aspects to the story. And in the book of Luke is where we learn that, um, in the book of Luke, we learn that the angel told Mary to name him Jesus. 
But you see, long before Jesus arrived on the stage in that first century, there were all kinds of names that described the coming Messiah. In fact, there's over 200 names that talk about the nature of God and what it will be like. And Emmanuel was one of them. So we have this naming of Jesus, which um, actually means the Lord of salvation. And then you have this name, Emmanuel, God with us. Now the author of Matthew was intentional in that. Because he begins the first chapter of Matthew giving a name to God that means God with us. But now I want us to flip to the last paragraph in the book of Matthew. And in the last book of Matthew, Matthew 28, we, read, we hear this. Therefore go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. Now listen carefully. Look, these are Jesus' words. I myself will be with you every day until the end of this present age. At the beginning, we hear God with us. At the end, we hear Jesus with us. This is the first message, the first thing I want you to hear from this mosaic of Christmas. God is with us. There is nowhere we can go that the presence of God isn't with us. And as we are racing through the season of Advent, filled with all of the busyness, God walks with us. That's a really important note. Because sometimes in this season, it's the loneliest season. Maybe we're carrying the burden, the financial burden by ourselves, or, or maybe we are feeling just really frustrated that we can't give our kids what we want to give them. Maybe we're feeling like we're carrying the load or the burden of Christmas and we're doing it alone. The thing is, we're not doing anything alone. God is with us. Our author was bookending this truth because it's so important. The mosaic of Christmas is teaching us we are never outside the love of God. That's an important thing to note because it's sometimes a hard Christmas. If you've lost somebody, if you're grieving, if you're grieving a, a, a broken relationship, Christmas is the worst time. Yet, Scripture is teaching us we are not alone. The second thing this mosaic is teaching us is, I think, a really interesting part of this story. And it has to do with Joseph. We hear that Joseph is a righteous man, but... I don't know that we really understand what that means or the significance of that. But there's this theologian named Fred Craddock who says that Joseph was probably the greatest interpreter of Scripture of all time in the first century. Let me see if I can explain this. When Mary found herself pregnant and unmarried, her life was at risk. You see, in the Old Testament... There were laws and standards that the people were called to live by. And they were created so that the people would understand that God does require standards of us. And I'm going to read one of those standards to you, and it's going to make you cringe. I will tell you there were also standards for men as well. But let me read to you a passage out of Deuteronomy 22, verses 20 through 21. In this tells us is what would have been standard or could have been a standard practice for a woman to find herself pregnant without being married. However, if the claim is true and proof of the young woman's virginity can't be produced, then the city's elders will bring the young woman to the door of her father's house, and the citizens of that city must stone her until she dies because she acted so sinfully in Israel by having extramarital um, relations while still in her father's house. All right. We know that Joseph knew that truth. He could have done the legal thing. Now, why would you say would Joseph even consider that? Well, because we live in this century, we don't live in the first century, we don't understand the shame that Mary had brought to Joseph. Joseph had committed his life to her. They were engaged. 
But the reality is the shame that would have fallen upon him was the, the town in which they lived began to see her tummy grow would have been unbearable. He would have been judged. He had been shamed. She had committed the ultimate insult to him. And I don't care how righteous he is, I'm pretty sure he was angry. Angry at the situation he was finding himself in because he didn't do anything wrong. He was a good man and suddenly he's living in a mess. Have you ever felt that way? I did it right and my life is still a mess and I'm sure Joseph felt that way. And he had a way to respond. He could prove to everybody that he was without sin and that Mary had made the mistake. He could have done that. But this is where we begin to see something was different about Joseph. I don't know how he reflected on that scripture, and we don't know why he did what he did. But I can't help but wonder if he was also remembering something else that was written in the Old Testament. Something from the, the book of Micah, Micah 6, 8, that says, He has told you, human one, what is good and what the Lord requires of you. Listen carefully. To do justice, embrace faithful love, and walk humbly with your God. This is why Joseph is considered an amazing interpreter of Scripture because when we read Scripture, we can easily pick out all the harsh Scriptures and just live by that. But the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ is love first. And that's the message we need because we all make mistakes. Mary didn't make any mistake. Mary found herself in this position. She had accepted. She had said, yes, God, I'm open to this idea. But she didn't do anything wrong. Yet I am sure no one believed her. She needed grace more than anybody. Joseph didn't understand what was happening. Joseph did not know at this point. The angel hasn't visited him yet. But he was choosing the way of mercy. Do you hear that? In the midst of this scandal, in the midst of all of his anger and his disappointment and his frustration, he chose mercy. He was going with love. He was humbly taking the right step. I bring that up because you know what's missing often in this season? is our humility because we're so busy and frantic. We're not thinking of others or the, uh, the impression we leave on them. We're just feeling the pressure of the season when in reality this is the very season where we should extend grace and mercy. This is our opportunity to live out the Christian story. And guess what? Most people will not deserve the grace and mercy we extend to them. And it's not because we feel like doing it. I am sure Matthew, excuse me, Joseph did not feel like doing this, yet he extended grace and mercy. So, this is the story so far of this Christian mosaic, the face of Jesus. As we walk through this season, number one, we remember God is with us. We're not doing this alone. And secondly, we can choose to extend grace and mercy first through this Advent season. There's one more thing I would like to share with you from this story. Again, we need the mosaic of the different books of the Bible in order to understand. And this is actually kind of a political part of the story that we often um, read. And maybe don't think of it as political, but it really is. It's the last piece of our mosaic for today. And I'm going to start with Luke 2, 1. So I'm jumping to another book. Because it starts like this. In those days, Caesar Augustus declared that everyone throughout the empire should be enrolled in a tax list. Now, this is an odd little detail that is thrown into the birth narrative. And it really is the political news of the day. The Roman Empire is so huge and massive at this point that they have probably conquered everyone they needed to conquer or they've scared everybody else into submission. And so they're going to have a registration. Everyone's going to be counted. They don't need to do this. Just think about it. This is about building up the empire again, proving to everybody how absolutely powerful they are. 
And can you imagine how disruptive it was to everybody? Whether you were the poorest or the wealthiest, this was disruptive. Everybody is to go to their hometown to be registered. For some, this would have been financially devastating, but at the very least, very inconvenient. And no one had a choice. And so this is just really building up the power of the empire, reminding everybody that you are powerless and we are all powerful. This is a political statement. Now, what I would like you to hear is a contrast. I actually heard this on a, on a podcast this week. And the author of the podcast was talking about this contrast between the Roman Empire and the Son of God's arrival on earth. You see, the Roman Empire is letting everybody know they rule and they reign. Yet the Son of God, the creator of the heavens, the creator of the earth, the one true God is sending his Son into the world. He's bursting into our world to bring us the answer to our problems. But it's nothing like the Roman Empire does things. It's so strange and under the radar. It's so absolutely quiet. Think about it. Jesus arrives in the world as homeless, unregistered, and undocumented. He is. He has a king, Herod, looking for him, the king of Judea, and he cannot find him anywhere. In fact, he tries to get the help of the, the magi to help him find the baby, but he is unsuccessful. With all his power and might, he cannot find this baby. And the only people that are told the location of the baby are a bunch of shepherds that no one would ever listen to or ever give a rip what they thought because they were without status. No one liked the shepherds. So why would you listen to their crazy story? So we have this contrast of this Roman Empire who's loud and obnoxious, disrupting everybody's life, and then you have the God of the universe quietly slipping into the world almost hidden. Now, why does that matter to us? It matters because that is the way God works in our lives. I would like to assure you that God lived, you know, arrives in our lives with a bang, and it's all loud and noisy, and we know when God is doing his work. But the reality is this is exactly how God works in our lives. It's quiet, and it's hidden. And you don't know when you're going to get the answer, and you don't know what it's going to look like, but still... God will arrive, and God will do his healing. You just don't have a clue when. And often you're not even going to see him working. This week I was talking to a friend that um, about two year, years ago went through a horrific divorce. You know, one of those divorces where everybody just falls apart. It's devastating on every level. And she has a lot of kids, and the kids... These amazing kids were just changing before our eyes. And I will tell you, I was so, felt so hopeless for them. It was such a mess. And I, I remember just thinking, oh my gosh, are these kids going to be ruined? No hope at all. And this week we were talking. And you know what? Two years has passed and somewhere in the midst of all this, God showed up in their world. Somewhere in the midst of this, God felt hidden at times. We couldn't always see him because it was so messy and it was so painful. But somehow, some way, God showed up. And do you know those kids are okay? They don't have a perfect life, but nobody does. But the kids are beginning to be like themselves again. And everybody's figuring out what life is like in a new way. And I know it is the hand of God who is at work healing even when we couldn't see God healing. Even when we couldn't see God's presence. Even when it just seemed so dark and hopeless. And I really felt in, in, like I was supposed to share that part today. I don't care what it looks like. I don't care how God may feel so distant like he doesn't care, like he's not there, like he's not showing up. Just because you can't see him doesn't mean he isn't at work. Because remember, he showed up in this world and no one knew. 
That's how he works. So how should all of this impact your Christmas? As I said, often this season seems to lack peace the most. And I, I will be really honest with you, I haven't figured this all out, but I've learned a few things as I've gotten older. There's a few advantages to getting older. You begin to see the rhythms of God and the movement of God. And I will tell you how I do it now as opposed to how I used to do it. I kind of joke about this, um, always working full time during the Advent season. Um, I... You know, Gary and I have very diverse roles in our family, and I can't imagine doing life together. With not, I can't imagine not doing life together because I feel like, I know, did I just say that? I know it. Yeah. yeah. This, this is normal for me to not get the words right. We, we really, I feel like the partnership I always dreamed I would have. But through the years when the kids were young, I had certain ideas about Christmas. And I always felt like I was carrying the bigger burden. And I always joked, I, um, we had a senior pastor, and it was, we were the three pastors, and I would always, every December, tell both of them at some point that I hated them because I knew they weren't in charge of all making it magical, you know? I mean, it was just a lot on me. And then somewhere along the way, I started remembering that God was with me. So what does that mean? Does it mean there's less work to do and less planning? No. It means I started an ongoing conversation with God through the month of December. Instead of hating everybody else who, who wasn't carrying the burden I was carrying, I started talking to God. I started saying, hey, help me let this go. Hey, help, help me to be more patient. God, you know, I'm, I can feel it. It's building. The stress is building. God, help me to figure out how to walk in grace. Help me to figure out how to let you be God in my life. Because he was there always. He was never not there. I was just forgetting to look to him and talk to him. I was too busy. So whatever you're feeling, God is with you. But you got to talk to him. you got to invite him into your world and start having those conversations with him. Because he will respond. And then I also, and this is the hard one for me, the hardest, I have to remember that I need to, make a special effort to be gracious <laughs> during the holiday. I get really cranky. So I have to remember that this whole season is about the grace of God. And just because I have the right to tell somebody they're doing something wrong doesn't mean I need to. I just need to shut my mouth and let God be God and be graceful. And thirdly, I had to remember that just because I don't see God at work, it doesn't mean he's not at work. At one point, I used to think, well, I prayed and I didn't feel any differently. And then I started to just be a little more sensitive to what was going on. And this is what I've learned with life. I pray and I ask God for his help. But what's different this time is I expect it. And I start looking for it. And it never happens in my timing. Never. And it doesn't happen quickly. But at some point, God has slipped in and calmed me down and brought me peace. And I'm never quite sure when he did it or how it happened, and sometimes I forget to thank him. But he always shows up. It's just quietly, differently than what I want, but he always shows up. I want to encourage you this last week as we are heading towards Christmas Eve. I hope you'll be able to come out to worship. I'm so excited to be able to worship. It is truly my favorite night of the year. It will be glorious because it's this reminder that we're never alone. It's this reminder that God is constantly with us. It's a reminder that by His grace, we will be able to extend His grace. And it's a reminder that he will slip into our problems and our struggles and all the stuff we feel hopeless about, and he will bring an answer in his timing and in his ways. May you know the peace of Christmas this year. May you know God's consistent grace. I want to end with John 16, 3. 
I've said these things to you so that you will have peace in me. In the world, you have distress, but be encouraged. I have conquered the world. Will you pray with me? Loving God, we are so grateful that we can come to you on this fourth Sunday of Advent and just simply worship. We thank you that you meet us in our needs. You meet us right in the space we are in and that we can always be honest. We can say, oh God, this has been wonderful and I'm so at peace. Or we can say, God, I'm a mess and I need your help. We can just simply be who we are and express what we feel and you will be there to love us and accept us and to help us. Merciful God, we want to lift up those who are still absolutely devastated from the tornadoes a week ago. I don't know what they're feeling in this season now. But I know they are in need of your love and your grace and your support. And merciful God, we're going to lift up those families of the kids who died in Australia this week in that tragic accident. Again, God, life can just dump us upside down sometimes and we don't see it coming and we're so devastated with the pain. And I just ask, loving God, that you will be with that family, with those community, with all those folks who are reeling. May they know your love and your mercy. And may their mosaic of this Christmas carry them through this very dark season. Loving God, help us to be the people you call us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, as Jane was speaking about um, peace in the midst of chaos, um, if you've ever been around kids at all to where the kids feel comfortable with you, I promise you that there is something magical about the bathroom door. Like, it doesn't matter how peaceful everything is. The second you, you go in there and close the bathroom door, every single kid in the house needs you. If you, <laughs> yeah. if you don't believe me, volunteer to babysit and, like, just try it out. Just go in there and shut that door and see what happens. And it's like all this chaos all of a sudden. You think, what was the, you guys were being so good. What is, what is the deal? And you just think, man, that is one place where you should feel like you're at peace. But, and so maybe, you know, maybe that's not what you're dealing with, but there's like bigger things going on in your life. And I think, you know, as Jane was speaking about, showing grace is, is really what creates peace a lot of times. So maybe, uh, maybe there's somebody who has offended you in some way, or maybe there's somebody that you think, man, I shouldn't have responded to them or reacted uh, that way to them, and, there's, and I should just send them a message. It can be that simple. And you never know how big of an impact that can be uh, to bring peace to a situation because um, I know for me, there's, uh, I have a youngest sibling that I don't get along with. I won't say his name because I don't ever know if this part gets streamed, but uh, he's, he reaches out to me the other day and just sends a message and, uh, and apologizes for some things that I didn't even know that he had done. And, <laughs> and, you know, but at the same time, I thought this is really cool it, that he would reach out to me and it just created this sense of peace and like, a little strengthening of our relationship and that might be that way within your family or even somebody outside of your family that you don't see very often that it's easy just to write off because you don't see them very often you know how big of an impact can that have uh, just to reach out and show them some grace and so I think that uh, during this time of reflection as we're doing this next song uh, maybe just search your mind search your heart and see you know who are those people who just grate on me I don't know why they do that kind of like I don't know why my kids have to knock on the bathroom door or the bedroom door or whatever it is every single time it's closed but you know what I love them anyway and so I think that you know those people that maybe you're difficult to get along with this is the perfect time and what better way to show the love of God than to reach out you take the initiative and to show grace to them the way that God's done that for us um, and during this next song, um, also, if you would like to um, give and give your offerings to the ministry here, to God, um, there's a basket up here in the front and in the back, but you can also give online. It's saumc.life and also through the Church Center app. So if you would join with us as we sing this next song, the uh, altar is also open if you'd like to come up here and pray. Holy night, the 
stars are brightly shining. It is the night of the dear Savior's birth. Long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. A thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn fall on your knees oh hear the angel voice
don't you uh, why don't you stand and join us as we sing our final song this morning? for joining us, whether it was here in person or online. Uh, let's close with a word of prayer. Uh, Father, we love you. We thank you so much that we can come together, worship you, learn what it means to uh, live in peace. And we know that that means sharing grace with other people, even when they uh, don't seem that gracious with us. And I pray that that would be uh, what we would do this week, that we would extend that grace to others. In your name, amen. All right, have a good week, everybody.